My name is Dr. Joel Rosen. I am the Adrenal Fatigue Recovery Ninja. And I'm really excited to welcome back uh, a special guest, Dr. Eric Balkavage. Um, he is widely recognized around the world as a leader in functional and regenerative medicine. He lectures across the world on biophysiology. Um, in his 20 years of practice, he has successfully helped thousands of people with suffering with a chronic health condition. Um, he talks about regenerative medicine, stem cell, cell therapy, thyroid dysfunction, methylation dysfunction, and many, many more. Um, currently, he's devoting his practice to regenerative uh, medicine and degenerative joint conditions, chronic pain, hypothyroid, GI disorders, diabetes, autoimmunity, inflammatory disorders, peripheral neuropathy, and metabolic changes. Um, he's a graduate of Palmer College of Chiropractic in Davenport, Iowa in 1995, and he's been in practice since 1996 in Glen Mills, Pennsylvania. He's also a board-certified uh, integrative medicine practitioner, and he's also a certified functional medicine practitioner and a certified nutritional specialist. So, Eric, thank you so much for being here on the call today. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Joel. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so um, I, what I really want to talk about today is you, you mentioned to me just a couple moments before we got started, um, a new paradigm of thyroid physiology. And, and I, you know, me being uh, the ninja in adrenal fatigue, I, I work with a lot of patients that suffer with, you know, an HPA axis dysfunction or um, cell danger responses, which we've talked about in the past, which basically means your body um, does what it needs to do to function and, and certain things um, take a back seat. So I, I wanted to talk to you about that specifically with the stress uh, model and what you're seeing nowadays with the with the way that thyroid um, thyroid I guess understanding and and thyroid uh, medicine is is headed towards. So why don't you first tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and and then we can sort of delve into what sort of is is coming down the pike now with with thyroid physiology. Well, as you said, I've been in practice for uh, 21, 20, yeah, 22 years now. And um, I started out, you know, just like you in, 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 in more from a chiropractic standpoint and, and deal with that. And then the longer you're in that business, the more you realize that many of our patients aren't healthy enough to maintain the corrections that we, we try and help them with. And uh, that leads you back into functional medicine, blood chemistry, nutrition, lifestyle medication. And uh, that transition for me happened uh, probably about 17 years ago, um, just realizing that I needed to help out family and patients with some of their chronic metabolic conditions and thyroid was, was one of those things that um, was rampant, it was a rampant problem. Uh, family members that had problems with thyroid physiology didn't really agree with the current uh, treatment protocol that they were going to be put on. And so I had to really dig in and figure out how thyroid physiology worked so that I could help uh, my family members. And then also then once you start talking to your patient base, you find out that almost everybody is on thyroid medication. And you're like, man, we got a bigger problem here. And for years until the opioids came about, you know, thyroid prescriptions were the leading prescription in the, in the U.S., um, we just have that many people getting different uh, types of thyroid prescriptions. And uh, I, I think when you start adding up how many people are getting different uh, thyroid prescriptions, you're like, holy cow, we have, uh, we have, a, we have a significant problem going on here um, where thyroid physiology is being uh, essentially shut down. Right. So, so okay, so the – as far as the the traditional approach goes, where we learn that the you know we look at TSH, which is a function of the pituitary, and then T4, which because ninety three percent is produced by the thyroid, that's kind of where it starts and ends for um, the traditional doctors um, in terms of their thyroid understanding. So why don't you kind of carry the torch from there? And, and start to go down the path of so much more of what we understand, especially as it relates to the stress response when we're overwhelmed and we have stressors that require our metabolic activity to increase and what goes wrong from there. Yeah. So I, I think what's, you know, for, you know, 50 plus years, the thought process has been is, 
that TSH uh, is a valid marker of thyroid hormone status throughout the body. And that as long as TSH is within lab range, uh, that thyroid physiology is optimized in all the cells of the body. And, you know, 20 some years ago, research was starting to show that, hey, TSH is not really a valid marker of full body thyroid status. TSH really um, is a indicator. You can use TSH as an indicator of thyroid disease when the body's in a state of homeostasis. And that's directly from a, a number of individual papers. Um, and But if you, if you kind of break that statement down, you go, okay, TSH is a valid marker or as an indicator of thyroid disease in a homeostatic state. Well, homeostatic state is a state of balance, ease, and wellness, right? Where we're meeting our energy needs and energy requirements are being met. Um, and is it, it's kind of seems odd to say that, okay, that we have thyroid disease in a homeostatic state. You would think that those two things would be, uh, if you had a homeostatic state, you wouldn't have thyroid disease, right? Or at least in my perception of uh, homeostasis, do we truly, will we truly have a disease state of one of our organs and tissues? I, I would think not. Um, but um, the problem with TSH is that TSH is just one piece or one measurement of thyroid physiology. And in a, in a homeostatic state where the body's in balance, um, yes, it may be an indication of what's happening uh, overall in the body. But the reality is all the cells of the body have different receptors, different transport mechanisms, have different deiodinase activity. Within, within the cell. And it's the individual cells of the body that actually determines what happens to thyroid hormone. You know, we put so much emphasis on the gland and really what's real, the real issue here is what's happening at the cellular level, not necessarily at the gland. So TSH is a indicator of thyroid hormone physiology, but not, not the indicator a thyroid hormone physiology, and it can often, oftentimes be um, normal and inappropriate, or it can be abnormal and totally appropriate for the given situation. And, and that may seem hard to, for some people to understand. How could it be normal and inappropriate? Well, if I'm in a state where I really should have my metabolism increase, or I really need to generate heat, let's say I'm in a cold environment, if I'm cold, I want to increase that thermometer. I want to increase TSH. I want to increase T4. I want to generate more heat energy to warm me up. And if I, if my TSH is normal in that situation, um, that's inappropriate because I really, if I'm, I really want that TSH to jump up, to increase T4 production, to increase T3 production, to get more thyroid hormone kicked in. If I've just eaten uh, I may want my thyroid physiology to kick in to then do something with that caloric intake. So I should see a rise in thyroid physiology. And, this, and, and the same is true in other situations. I may want to see thyroid physiology decreased. And so maybe TSH should be low. So it could be um, normal, but inappropriate given the stress or strain of the body. The other thing, the other side of that is it can be abnormal totally appropriate, right? So it is not always the case where we can just look at a TSH and say, hey, uh, TSH is normal. Uh, therefore, the thyroid physiology is normal. It just doesn't work that way. We know, and you, you know, you talk about adrenal physiology all the time. We know that inflammation will suppress the anterior pituitary uh, and decrease the production of TSH. So in that situation, I may have an inflammatory state going on. I may have hypothyroid symptoms. And then we take a look at TSH and we see that TSH is normal and the doctor may not realize that the patient's in an inflammatory state. And the only reason their TSH is normal is because the pituitary can't produce it. Um, I can give you another example of, uh, you know, you, there's different medications that people can take. Uh, Losartan, is, which is a blood pressure medication, is, is one of those. And Losartan will essentially increase the conversion of T4 to T3 in, in the hypothalamus uh, and in the brain, and suppress TSH. So a person could be uh, hypothyroid symptoms, and yet because of the blood pressure medication changing 
thyroid hormone, increasing thyroid hormone conversion in the brain, the brain gets sufficient levels of T3 suppressing TSH production while the rest of the body struggles with thyroid, uh, with hypothyroid physiology because TSH is, looks normal, but the patient's still symptomatic, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes a whole lot of sense. There's a lot of bullet points in there. Um, to summarize some of the main ones in terms of the, um, the new model is going from <clears throat> a two-dimensional, um, let's look at this and see what the impact, you know, and infer if TSH is low, then the, the thyroid may be overactive, or if it's high, the thyroid may be underactive from a primary point of view, the thyroid's not working, or vice versa if it's a secondary point of view, but it's very reductionistic. Now it actually puts the onus on the doctor um, to understand the context of what's going on with the patient. And God forbid you have to ask them questions, right? Like, tell me about what's going on with your life. What are your stressors? Have you had a recent cold? Have you had an injury? Do you get exposures to chemicals and toxins? You know, what, you know, tell me about your life because now you can put it in context. So it seems like that two-dimensional model is now going into three dimensions in terms of putting it into context, number one. And then number two, the big difference also seems to be it's, it's, it's tissue specific. And you don't necessarily have a, um, a generalization of if it's, if it's this way in the, in the brain, in the bloodstream, it's got to be this way in the kidneys or in the, in the liver or in the adrenals or whatever it may be. So, so I guess the question would be, you know, if I'm, the, you know, I'm listening to this and I'm well-versed and I'm a typical patient that um, is not in the medical field and, and I'm trying to figure it out on my own because doctors aren't really listening to this and they don't want to hear it. Um, how, how would I now take that next step of kind of in an algorithm in a, in a sensible way like okay now that I understand that it goes more than just TSH um, I understand that TSH may be high um, for a reason and that doesn't necessarily mean I got to take more thyroid hormone um, or it may be low for a particular reason and that may also be okay as well. So it, it kind of, to me, it sounds like now I'm even more confused, right? So bring us some, some sort of clarity, Eric, on as a patient, you know, what other things I may be looking at um, to support, you know, to support my thyroid, I guess that's the way so, I would ask. Yeah, I think the first thing you have to, we have to consider is do, you know, what are, what's my symptomatology, right? Do I have symptoms of hypothyroidism? Uh, and so if somebody goes on the web and they say, I have dry skin, I have thinning hair, I'm struggling with weight issues, I'm constantly fatigued, I have brain fog, I have constipation, you know, and they look on the, on the web, uh, on your site, my site, and they find, hey, I've got all these symptoms uh, that are associated with hypothyroidism. Uh, there's a good chance that they have what I term in, uh, cellular hypothyroidism or tissue hypothyroidism, which means the thyroid hormone uh, that is getting to the cells is instead of being converting to, converting to T3 and stimulating metabolism is actually being deactivated to something called reverse T3. And um, all the different thyroid hormones have some type of action or function, but that's a more complex situation. So we'll just use a general term that if t thyroid hormone, once it gets to the cell, can either be activated and get to the nucleus and stimulate metabolism and you feel good, you have energy, you're warm, your bowels move, you, have, you don't have fatigue, got the chronic fatigue, or that thyroid hormone can be deactivated. So T4 can be deactivated to something called reverse T3. T3 can become uh, deactivated to something called T2. And those, in a, a very general sense, those, those thyroid hormones are less functional. They don't stimulate the normal cell metabolism, uh, and therefore those patients are typically going to experience hypothyroid symptoms. So one, one, if you have hypothyroid symptoms, if you read the blogs, you have them, consider the fact that hypothyroidism in a general medicine, allopathic medicine practice is only occurs te technically when you have primary hypothyroidism when the gland is diseased. But in my world uh, of functional medicine, I really look at 
the thyroid gland disease or dysfunction as the end stage, not the beginning stage. So any, if you have those symptoms, the next thing you have to think about is, all right, so why is this normal or abnormal? And we typically talk about cell danger response if there's some type of stress, whether it's acute or chronic, and that stress can be physical, it could be chemical, it could be emotional, it could be microbial. Those stressors then can, when you, when you reach a certain level of stress within the cell, that cell starts to signal, get signals of, hey, there's danger here the cell starts to deactivate thyroid hormone to slow the metabolism down. And that is not, I don't think a mistake. And I think you'd agree with me there. That's really more of a protective mechanism. If I have a virus within it, within my cells, I don't want to speed up the metabolism of that cell. I don't want to feed that cell. I want to starve the cell. I want to uh, reduce the metabolism of the cell. So that way the cell starts uh, a defensive mechanism mode where it increases oxidative stress, increases inflammatory chemicals, it induces something called autophagy. And essentially what the cell is trying to do is get rid of the threat. And if we increase the cell metabolism, essentially what we do is we wind up feeding the threat, uh, the bacteria, the virus, whatever, whatever is there. And so our primary thought process is, if, if does this patient have symptoms? And if they do, is there stress that makes sense for why they would be symptomatic? So do they have some type of chronic infection, whether it's gut or systemic? Do they have chronic emotional stress, bad marriage, real high stress at work? They're not sleeping. They're not recovering. They're a mouth breather at night. They have sleep apnea. Um, their diet's terrible. They have immune uh, uh, reactivity to food or food intolerance. Uh, maybe they have uh, chronic injury or chronic pain, something like that. If they have those things going on uh, that have exceeded their cell's ability to maintain um, an, ener an energy balance or homeostasis, then the cell induces this cell danger response. It says, hey, there's a threat. Let's ad address the threat. Slow down cell metabolism. Warn all the other cells that there's a problem here. So they slow down their metabolism and we can kind of wall off the threat, get rid of the threat, and then our our physiology can turn back on. Part of that whole cell danger response is the deactivation of thyroid hormone for which you are going to experience symptoms. And this happens in the presence of a totally healthy thyroid gland. So TSH can be totally normal. Um, there could be no disease of the gland, no autoimmune attack on the gland at this point. It's just Thyroid, thyroid gland is working. There's plenty of thyroid hormone in the blood, but the cells are either not taking up as much thyroid hormone, so the blood values look really good, or what the cell is allowing to come in from a thyroid hormone status, a, large, uh, a, a larger portion of that thyroid hormone is being deactivated. And so for a patient who has symptoms, one of the first things they need to realize is if I have a bunch of these symptoms, I have cellular hypothyroidism going on. That's phase one of a thyroid condition, in, in my opinion, in many cases, is the cellular hypothyroid pattern and the symptoms. And then if they have it, the second thing they need to do is either on their own or with somebody's help, try and identify what are the stress or stressors that are creating uh, the cell danger response. And they have to go look at the physical, the chemical, the emotional, and the microbial and many times people, if they really sit down and start thinking about what's going on in their life and they're objective about it, they can start to say, yep, all this started happening after this, or it's been, I started feeling bad when, you know, after my divorce or after somebody passed away or after the stressor or this trauma or whatever. And many times they have a good idea of when it started, but then you have to go back and address whatever those stressors are. And the reality is some, for some people, it's a bad marriage and they got to fix the marriage. For some people, it is um, th their lifestyle habits are, are just lousy and they need to clean them, clean them up. For other people, they're, they're, they're toxic and they need to address that. For others, they just have systemic infections uh, that they need to address. So, yeah, again, like 
really great insights, Eric. We talked earlier about how the onus is on the doctor to get more insight in terms of, you know, a two-dimensional reductionistic approach of, okay, let's just take this if that's low or take this if that's high. But also now the onus is really on the patient, right, in terms of figuring out why um, or, or, or trying to understand and not be so reactionary in terms of, okay, um, I'm feeling these hypothyroid symptoms. Um, I have brain fog. I feel cold. I'm not being able to lose weight. I have gastrointestinal bloating um, and, um, and so forth. And, and then the, the onus is, is really to try to understand, okay, I'm at a cellular hypothyroid uh, uh, sort of um, presentation where um, the active hormone is, is being deactivated. It's not getting into the cell and the body's doing that for a reason. Um, but what, where does that leave them in terms of, well, I do like the idea of getting some thyroid support. Um, it does give me some energy. What's the fine line between chasing your tail and whack-a-mole of, okay, it's too high now. I got to go low. I got to go low. I got to go high. I mean, how, how do you suggest we, we integrate that with our current approach? Well, I think there's a couple things. One, I think it is a partnership between doctor and patient to help them get better, right? And um, doctors in, in an allopathic world are, you know, are are under the gun as well. I mean, they're, they, they, they are told that they only need a TSH and T4 value to treat somebody. Uh, all, people only need thyroid hormone medication if TSH is elevated and T4 is lab low. And so their hands are tied to some degree. They have limited time for patient care. And so I, I, I just think there's um, the models the model is outdated and it's just a bad model. And really, if a medical doctor maybe had more time to investigate it, if they, under, if they were allowed to do things maybe a little bit differently without getting their hand slapped, maybe they would do that. Um, but for the patient, the big challenge is if you are, um, if you're, so I guess we should do this. The patient's got the, uh, they got this cellular hypothyroidism going on. Um, and, uh, we said the cell th thyroid hormones being deactivated. You got to look for the stressor, the stressor. Most people are not maybe going to even be aware that this is going on. So then they kind of go through another phase and, and, and I'll, I'll lay out those phases that we could talk about where medicine kind of approaches it and why maybe that that doesn't work out as well for a lot of patients. But if the cell danger response continues, and we've all been under a cell danger response, we've all had cellular hypothyroidism at one point or, or another. Anytime you get a bacterial infection or a viral infection and you feel lousy, you're in cellular hypothyroidism. You're tired, you're fatigued, your brain's not working, you're, you're lethargic. That's cellular hypothyroidism. We all get it. It should, you know, anytime we get sick, we really want cellular hypothyroidism to kick in. But usually, that cell danger response lasts maybe four, five, six, seven, eight, ten days, and then you know the threat is killed. The thyroid physiology turns back on, and we feel good, right? Uh, so we all have experienced it at some point, and up these ups and downs of uh, cellular hypothyroidism at per periods of times. The problem is, is that many of us are under chronic stress, and so uh, as chronic stress builds, it's lifestyle stress. It's I'm not sleeping well. I, my diet's bad. I'm I, you know all of these things start to compound and the stress becomes more chronic. And as we have this chronic stress kind of kick in, the body shifts, um, the, th the cell danger response becomes a little bit more persistent. And one of those things is the release of those inflammatory chemicals to warn all the other cells that, hey, not only do I have one cell that's having a problem, I've got multiple cells. And so we have this systemic inflammatory response that kicks in, that triggers more symptomatology, that can suppress the anterior pituitary, falsely looking, making our TSH levels look good, like we mentioned before. The, the other piece of that is, is that the cell danger response and the damaged cells can release uh, signaling molecules called DAMPs and PAMPs. And these things, along with the inflammatory chemicals, can send signals to different tissues of the body that, hey, we need to activate the immune system because there's problems here. Um, and those damps and pamps can activate the immune system to kick it in, to come help kill things. But they can also activate uh, the autoimmune attack at the thyroid gland. And so that's where we start to see some damage to the thyroid gland. 
some of the disease state of the thyroid gland. And it kind of makes sense. If I'm trying to slow metabolism down at the cellular level um, and by deactivating thyroid hormone, that takes a certain amount of work. It's like if I wanted to change the, the valve on a hose, right? I could have you pinch the hose, hold it, and then I can screw off the valve, put a new valve on, and voila, I'm good to go, right? If it's short-lived, you don't mind holding that valve pinched for, or the hose pinched for a while. But if I'm under chronic stress, to try and deactivate all the cells, the thyroid hormone at all the cells becomes more of a workload. And so what's the next easiest thing to do? If I said, Joel, I'm going to change the valve on the, on the nozzle on this hose, I want you to pinch it, but I'm going to run off to Home Depot and I'm going to go to the work and then I'm going to do a bunch of things and I'll be back in about eight hours. You would say, well, I'm not going to stand here and pinch the hose. I'll just go turn the valve off. And the immune system and the, and the physiology of the body is pretty intelligent. When there's a chronic stress, what we typically start to see is autoimmune attack on the thyroid gland. And we, we can call that autoimmune attack Hashimoto's thyroiditis, where the immune system starts creating antibodies against different parts of the thyroid uh, glandular tissue. And a lot of times, even in functional medicine, we look at that as, the, as a mistake, right? Like the body's making this mistake. And I just don't think that that's necessarily always a mistake. I think many times that's part of this cell danger response. When that cell danger response releases the DAMPs and the PAMPs, uh, these signaling molecules, the thyroid gland is very perceptive to those. And the thyroid gland gets a signal that, hey, there is a more of a systemic issue going on here. We don't need more thyroid hormone. So let's just shut it down right at the gland. And it makes a ton of sense. We see that in state in states of uh, of famine or starvation, one of the things the body will do is downregulate thyroid physiology, slow metabolism down, create autoimmune attack on the gland. And you say, why is that a good thing? Well, if I don't have much food, or I'm, and I, then I want to slow the metabolism down. If I keep my metabolism high, I'm going to burn through the food I have, and then I'm going to start eating myself up. So under a situation like that, the body can actually start shutting down the gland that it doesn't need a lot of function from. So that's more of like that, that second wave or that second phase. The first phase is we have the stressor, then we have the cell danger response, then we have the cellular hypothyroidism, then we have the autoimmune attack on the thyroid gland. And through these phases, TSH will typically be normal. T4 will be normal. Um, and your doctor's doing his job. He's running a TSH thinking everything's good. He's running T4. It still looks good. TSH may lo look normal because uh, there's an inflammatory mechanism going on suppressing the anterior pituitary, keeping it from producing TSH, or that the brain is getting the, as much thyroid hormone as it needs and under stress conditions, the brain and the, and the peripheral tissues, the body react differently. So the brain will quickly get T4 to T3 conversion, where the peripheral cells, uh, they will not. And that makes sense as well. If I'm under stress and I'm under attack and I have a, the proverbial tiger chasing me, uh, I, I'm going, I need my brain to work. I don't necessarily need to have a libido. I don't necessarily need to have uh, good bowel motility. I don't need to have a lot of other things going on. All I need to do is figure out how the heck to get out of Dodge and get away from the threat. So brain up, and the brain and the body regulate uh, much differently um, under a stress condition. So then eventually uh, what happens is if that, per that stress continues, we have the cellular hypothyroidism, which is driving the symptoms. Then we start to see the autoimmune attack. Eventually after years, months or even years, the person still complaining of all the same symptoms will finally get a TSH level that's maybe starting to rise. Uh, and their doctor might say, hey, you, your TSH is a bit elevated, but your T4 is still normal. They may even diagnose it as subclinical hypothyroidism, but there's no treatment to be given at this point under the typical allopathic model. And I, and I agree that we probably shouldn't be treating that person with T4 or T3 in that situation. Um, and the reason is, there's a couple things there. TSH may be elevated because now the brain is not getting sufficient T4 conversion into T3. The, the, mount, the T4 in the blood may still look normal because it's not getting into the peripheral tissues like it once did. So it artificially looks normal, but it's because it's not getting into the tissue sufficiently. And so 
if you provided somebody more T4 in this situation, what we already know is, is that T4 is not transporting into the peripheral cells real well. It's probably not being converted from T4 to T3. It's probably being deactivated. So giving somebody more T4 may support brain, but it's probably going to create uh, more symptomatology uh, for the person, not improve symptomatology overall. Um, it'd be like saying, you know, the gas tank is full, but I'll put more gas in and the car should run better. It's not necessarily going to happen. And hypothyroidism, especially at the cellular level, we know to some degree is protective. So if we have a bunch of sick cells and we try and force more thyroid hormone into the body, one of the things we can do is have replication of sick cells. And I don't know that we want to replicate sick cells. Uh, a, we can spread the bacteria, the virus, whatever's going on. But B, uh, the replication of sick cells is something that we call in, in allopathic medicine, often called cancer, right? So is that something we really want to do? I think the best mechanism is to get to root cause, but that's really not part of that allopathic model. And then eventually that person's going to develop, uh, get to a point where their TSH is elevated and T4 eventually drops way too low because the gland's been being attacked. We've been in that subclinical state for a while the autoimmune attacks happening at the gland, eventually the gland just can't make enough T4 and T3. What's in the bloodstream becomes diminished. Now your doctor looks and says, TSH is high, T4 is low. Now you're a good candidate for thyroid hormone. And so they'll put more T4 into the system. Uh, it will support brain really pretty quickly because of the regulating mechanisms different in the brain than the body. So TSH can normalize uh, the person may have a short honeymoon period because the brain is actually working a little bit better. And it may be um, okay to get at least get them at some level of function. But if this is all we do for the person, they're still going to be symptomatic because the T4 that the body was making wasn't getting into the cells. And, it was, and what was getting into the cells was getting deactivated. The T4 that we give them via pill um, is same thing's going to happen. It's going to support brain, normalize TSH, but the peripheral tissues are still going to reduce transport and deactivate it. So they're still going to be stuck in what I call the roller coaster ride, which is where they feel better initially, and then they start not feeling so good. And now their doctor's constantly tinkering with T4 doses, T4, T3 combinations, trying to uh, normalize TSH, but help their patient's symptoms. And the big point is still being missed hypothyroid symptoms are caused by lack of thyroid hormone in the peripheral tissues. Um, that's it. I mean, it's that simple. And if you have hypothyroid symptoms, it doesn't matter what your TSH or your T4 levels are. You're not getting sufficient thyroid hormone to the nucleus of the cell to stimulate what we call normal metabolism. And until we address what's inhibiting that, uh, the person's going to struggle and they're going to have chronic symptomatology. Yeah, I mean, I'm now going to have to rewind and watch that over and over again. I think like the first time that we talked, um, but I think the summary on that is getting healthy, right? I mean, at the end of the day, we're talking about a paradigm shift in, in health care from the point of view of we, let's not be reductionistic and, and, and take this for that and that for this, but let's get back to, you know, living a healthy life. And that means, you know, from, from an adrenal point of view, um, from, you know, all the things that stress us and the same thing that stresses for the thyroid and the, the regulation from the pituitary is all our daily stressors. Like you mentioned, a, a, a tough marriage, um, you know, a, a chemical exposure, a, um, a diet that doesn't have good nutrients and is high in, in inflammatory foods. Um, and, and, and at the end of the day, it comes down to um, addressing why the body is in a cell danger response in the first place and understanding that the, the old model of looking at TSH and T4 um, are not going to be a really good indication of what's going on in your body. I mean, I think that's kind of a, a summary of what you're saying. And then on top of that, if you, if you continue to pump in the T4 and the T3 support, there may be a honeymoon time 
but at, but at the end of the day, it comes down to now um, having to unwind not just the problem that caused the mechanics to be faulty in the first place, but the compensation that you were doing medically with all your medications and so forth as well. It becomes a bit of a chaos, a chaotic uh, mess, I guess. So for, for what would you recommend then for uh, on, on the side of getting healthy um, and on the person who's been taking a lot of thyroid meds and you see them all the time in terms of their T3 is really high, their TSH is like 0 0.001, whatever. How would you approach that, especially as a, a functional medicine doctor or a, a non-traditionally trained doctor, and we're not licensed to take people off their medications, but it's blatant that, okay, you're getting way too much here, and we don't want that risk of, of mutation or cell division or driving the, the diminishment of nutrients and raw materials um, because it's driving you into the ground here, because there's a lot of those people. So how, what's the best approach you found with your practice to, when, the, when it's clear cut like that, to, that it's just way too much? So one of those things we have to do is really have a, a, a conversation with our patient and try and educate them as much as possible. Because I think one of the things that's tough in, in our world is um, the patient goes to, we explain stuff to the patient. It makes sense to them. They go in and they talk to their primary care or their endocrinologist who either says, um, you know, why would I listen to them? I'm an endocrinologist. You know, I just got this the other day. Uh, actually, I think somebody responded to a podcast that you and I did about adrenal fatigue saying there's no such thing. And, da, da, da. and so, you know, the, the reality is, is that it's, it's, uh, it's, it has to become an educational process uh, for the patient first. Uh, we have to explain to them the physiology of what's happening here. And if they can understand that, then we can give them the talking points to talk to their doctor about. And so they understand how to communicate. The second thing is, is that you and I, when we, we have to do our best to be non-confrontational with uh, their supporting doc or not make that patient think that it's really a battle between me versus their other doctors, but really that we're all working as a team to try and get them better. And that the model that they're in are, is obviously not as effective as they'd like it to be. They're alive and they're managing life, but they're not thriving in life. And our goal with functional medicine is to help them actually thrive in life uh, and to not just manage disease states, but actually to get them healthy. And those are two different models. And it's really important for them to understand their doctor isn't necessarily a bad person. What they're doing is what they've been taught. And it's, you know, as far as thyroid physiology goes, they've been taught to just manage a TSH now and T4 value with medications. If those ranges are in, those values are within their normal lab range, there's nothing to do and everything's really maybe other, another problem or a psychosomatic issue or a laziness issue or a food intake issue. And we know that's just not the case. So I think for most patients, we have to do a good job of breaking this down for them that there is some form of stress that's creating the cell danger response if that cell danger response has gone on for an extended period of time, it is actually causing changes in systemic in system function. So thyroid physiology has now changed. Your uh, energy metabolism has now changed. Your GI physiology has now changed. And so we not need to reduce that stressors as best we can. Some of those systems will now start to come back into normal function, and some are going to need help and assistance to come back into normal function because they've adapted for a period of time to that stress response. And so their physiology has changed to some degree. I guess if you were driving your car on a flat tire for an extended period of time, the front end alignment would go out of alignment, okay, because it's adapting to that the problems in that, in that tire. And just because we put a new tire on the car doesn't mean we've fixed this now dysfunctional alignment. We need to go back and fix that. So I think for like a patient or a listener, one of those things they have to do is, is understand is, hey, do I have chronic fatigue issues? Do I have hypothyroid symptoms? And if I do, then more stuff into the system, you know, like more medications to manage it or uh, is not necessarily the long-term solution. It may be a short-term solution to help you just initially feel better, um, but it's not a long-term solution, and that's what people struggle with. 
Um, and so they need to be able to work with somebody to say, okay, let's go back and find out what our stressors are. Let's get some better, um, more comprehensive tests done. And from my perspective, it's one of the things that I know that I do and I know you do is just run better blood work uh, as initial finding for people and let them know that, hey, a, t a thyroid physiology panel is more than TSH and T4. It's TSH, it's T4, it's T3, it's free T4, it's free T3, it's T3 uptake, it's thyroid antibodies, it's reverse T3. And we can look at lab values, not just at face value, but what a whole pattern of lab values tells us about a person. Uh, if we run, the, we can see if there's cellular hypothyroidism going on. We can kind of see when you understand what a marker means just besides whether it's high or low out of lab range, what the labs are telling us. And I think that's a big problem uh, outside of, inside functional medicine to some degree, but probably more outside of functional medicine and allopathic medicine where the only thought process about labs is if they're out of lab range, high or low. Well, you and I both know that if somebody's got uh, hemoglobin A1C that's elevated and insulin that's elevated, that tells us a story. That tells us that the person is now insulin resistant or pre-diabetic. In conventional allopathic medicine, they may say they're not outside of lab range. They're not diabetic yet. There's nothing to treat. And to their you know, defense, that's right. They're, they're, they're not treating anything yet, but that's the tool in their toolbox is to treat that disease with, or manage that disease, what we call that physiologic whack-a-mole. You got high blood pressure, boom, I'll give you something to lower it. And that is a uh, management strategy, but that's not a health strategy. And so we talk all the time about, hey, the best thing to do for the person isn't necessarily manage all their conditions and manage their lab ranges but to actually improve their health so that those lab values now start to normalize uh, and become appropriate uh, just through fixing the, the broken machinery or the broken chemistry or removing the stress response. So I think it's our job is to help them understand what are the stressors are, help them understand that there isn't a magic pill to give them, there isn't a magic supplement to give them, that we have to uh, remove those things, help the body and the systems that have become compromised start to kind of reorganize themselves. We may have to help them kind of reestablish normal function. Uh, we can use diet, lifestyle, nutrition, supplementation to help bring those things back. Uh, depending on the state of their physiology, yes, medications can potentially be one of those things that help kind of get them back. But if we're only using the medications to normalize numbers, that's not a solution for long-term health. You, can't, you just can't drug yourself healthy, unfortunately. And then our, our job long-term is to then say, all right, now we can use these, um, uh, these same ideas and these lab and these broader lab tests and these, and these narrower lab ranges to help you manage health, not just disease for the long run. And then we don't have to see them that often. I mean, they, we give them the tools to be able to take care of themselves and understand how to get out of their problem. Yeah, again, like lots of lots of clinical tools in there, Eric. Um, and I think a, a couple commentaries, I, I don't know if you're seeing it, but I'm seeing it, and I'm sure you are too, that you do see more of a, a complex, I think your your cellular, cellular hypothyroid model is really getting spread. Like I think there's a lot of people out there that, that are now looking at reverse T3 and, and the ratio of free T3 to that. And they're coming with more complete tests um, and, and they, they get more of that. Um, I think that's changing. I do see that changing. Um, and, um, and I would agree with you where it comes down to running um, some other supportive testing and looking at why, um, what's driving the, the danger. Um, what's the microbiome like? You're big into biophysiology, and that's a whole other podcast, but that, um, that is a big one as well. And then, of course, the methylation behind that and not being able to um, make healthy nutrients or, or, or healthy physiology for removing toxins and then that just coming back into the body and driving a lot of these cell danger responses as well. So I think there's a, there's a sort of a whole can of worms, so to speak, in terms of um, what it takes to get healthy. Um, but I think if we can change the paradigm from um, understanding that it, 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 
that the cell danger may be the reason why is exactly the reason why it's high and it's low and it's not necessarily a reflexive um, take this or take that to fix it. It's like, okay, I see you. Um, I'm going to, you know, address some of the upstream mechanisms for the longer term good. So let me ask you this is as far as like some of the effective, maybe just key to, you know, nuggets that people can walk away with that are understanding everything we're saying up until now. And they say, well, how do I get my reverse T3 low? What, what have you found to be a good, cause everyone likes, you know, well, what can I take naturally for that? Or how can I get um, my, um, I guess, my, my liver to work better in terms of converting from T4 to T3? Or how can I get um, the hypothalamus and the pituitary to, to maybe be a little more adaptogenic and not be so overwhelmed? Are there any clinical tools that you have or re- suggestions that you've been seeing a lot of success with in your practice? So, I mean, it always comes up like the... Um, and we see that in the blogosphere, like, okay, if I take selenium, that will help my conversion of T4 to T3. Um, and I don't believe that, that that's happening, okay? All the deionases uh, are, are going to need selenium so that if, if, if their reverse T3 is elevated, uh, T4 is, the deionases are working, right? So T4 is converting to reverse T3, it's using selenium, so there must be selenium there. I think it's uh, how things are uh, allocated in certain situations. Is there a magic uh, solution? You know what, Joe, I wish I, wish I could tell, tell you there was. Um, and the more research and stuff I do, the more I realize there isn't a, there isn't a super secret thing. Um, I, I'm a, I am a fan of black cumin seed oil because it's immune and uh, autoimmune modulatory effects. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a downside to it. Um, but there are but I, and I, you know, can selenium be good? Can B vitamins be beneficial? Can magnesium be really important? I think all of those things are, are uh, can be beneficial, but there is no, there is no magic bullet here to help somebody get uh, dramatically better. Or there, I should say, there's no magic bullet that's going to help everybody the same, right? So if somebody's got adrenal, just, they're just wiped out and their adrenal systems, uh, and we, we've talked about this in the before, whether they're in adrenal fatigue or really the thyroid or the adrenal hormone is the cortisol is just being deactivated to, cortis, to cortisone or it's going right into the fat and it's never getting utilized or it's not getting free and it's always bound. You know, are there things that you can use potentially to support? But you know this as well as I do. Um, you can try it on one person. They say, okay, that helps me. You, did, you give the same thing to somebody else with the same symptoms and they go, nah, doesn't do anything. Because it's not, it's it's different for each individual person. I think the best thing that the individuals that are listening to this can do is to say, "All right, let me clean up my diet." I mean, that's a number one cheap thing to do: eat whole food, real food diet. Don't get caught up too much in whether um, all the nitty gritty of people fighting about the whether vegetarians better than paleo or better. Just eat real food, right? Eat food like it walked the earth, came out of the ocean, off the tree or out of the ground. If you do that, eat more of that stuff, you're going to be better off. We can have nuanced arguments later, but eat better. Um, you know, definitely focus on your emotional state, how you perceive things. We all have a tendency to kind of stress and worry about things, and we don't necessarily realize the impact that's having on our physiology, um, and it can be huge. And I think we sometimes poo-poo the emotional piece um, way too much. I mean, uh, we were both at a conference where um, we were introduced to a, a product called BrainTap, right? And um, I kind of poo-pooed it a little bit. And I know you were like, man, I really noticed a change. And what I realized is that, you know, the more I utilized it, the calmer I was and the more relaxed I was. There was no like, aha, like, woohoo, you know, moment for me where I put it on, I'm like, oh, now I feel all, all spiritual and not and, and in balance. It wasn't like that for me, but I definitely feel like overall, uh, when I'm using the, a system like that, it does calm my brain. It, it, brain, it does calm my psyche, my heart rate variability is better. And so that piece plays a huge role. So monitor your heart rate variability. If you don't have a tool, there's lots of tools or a ring, bio strap, there's a bunch of those things. Find out where your heart rate variability is really focus on what's going on in between the six inches of your ears, get active and mobile. I mean, that's an easy one because 
for most of us, even if we're exhausted and tired and fatigued, just getting a little bit more mobile than you currently are, whether you're lifting weights or just going for a walk or doing some type of cardiovascular activity, it reduce, releases so many in, endorphins and positive chemicals. It promotes sleep and helps you with sleep. I mean, there's so much benefit to it. So you don't have to go from zero to an hour. It's better off you go from, a, from zero to two minutes, to four minutes, to six minutes. Do a little bit more today than you did yesterday. And I think if we work on what we call those fitness factors, uh, mindset, sleep, respiration, diet, um, and uh, fitness, most people, those are going to be the magic bullets. And then after that, the, everything else is variable with individual people. And I think the best thing for people to do is see somebody like you or see somebody like me who's going to take a more comprehensive blood panel and understand hey, what's going on here? I have, in, I have like eight markers here that show that there's chronic inflammation going on or systemic inflammation going on by CRP, homocysteine, uric acid, uh, fibrinogen, ferritin. And so we look at the test, not like, oh, your iron's high or iron's low. We look at the test and say, all right, these things tell us there's inflammation. Now our job is to figure out what's causing the inflammation. Is it physical, chemical, emotional, or microbial? And probably you're going to need somebody who's in, a, in functional medicine to take the time to help you do that. There's no magic bullet to bring those things down. Yeah, you can use things like systemic enzymes to help reduce the inflammatory mechanism. We can take anti-inflammatory uh, chemicals. We can take antioxidants. But I don't think one-off products like that uh, are the best way to do it, at least for the long run. Short run, maybe just to get things under check. One of my favorite things to support uh, the natural antioxidant, anti, uh, anti-inflammatory process is uh, broccoli sprouts. Um, broccoli sprouts upregulate something called NRF2. It's not a sustained effect. It's a short-term stimulation. Uh, and broccoli sprouts are food. You can eat them. They're healthy. You can also purchase them. You just got to be cautious when you purchase them because they're not always what they say they are. But US Enzymes and I partnered together to produce a, a product called sulfur, Sulforzyme. Uh, that'll be out mm, probably in the next month or so, which is a uh, uh, broccoli sprout product with active what we call morosinase enzyme to help you get the full benefit of like eating sprouts, but in a capsule form. So if there's a couple things like easy, def definitely I would look at something like black cumin seed oil. I would definitely look at uh, sulforaphane uh, uh, as, a, as two things that have, don't really have negative connotations to them. Uh, and it can be good things to do beneficially. And you can do both. They're both natural food sources. So I, I really like those options. Um, beyond that, um, I think there's a complexity to everybody's issue. And, and as a person who specializes in adrenal issues, you know this, there are so many products on the market that people can take to try and uh, to, for adrenal fatigue or for, uh, to jack their adrenals or adaptogens or whatever. And they can be beneficial for some, but if you're taking those or you've been taking those for extended periods of time and you're still symptomatic, you're not getting at the root issue. You're just doing with supplements what allopathic medicine is doing with medication. So good short term, but we always need to try and get to root issues and unfortunately, you know this as well as I do, just because you address it today and you get it under control doesn't mean next year you're, going to be, you're not going to be symptomatic again because life continues. And so that's where it's beneficial to check in with a, a functional medicine practitioner on a regular basis, get a good comprehensive metabolic panel, maybe something like organic acid test or a, a test that uh, I know you and I both use the Dutch test because it's got hormones and it's got organic acids on it. So we can get a good assessment of what's going on with somebody's health before they become really problematic, before they need bottles and bottles of supplements. We could say, hey, look, these, these things are out of range. Your stress level is high. What's going on in your life that we can change and adapt to get you to become um, back into range without having to apply you with a whole bunch of bottles of supplements or medications? Yeah, awesome answer. There's lots of really great clinical tools or clinical um, step walkaways with that. The only other thing I would add, Eric, was hydration. You know, and I've, I'm a big 
Dr. Marshall from PRL follower, and he was a big half your body weight in ounces. And if you're drinking caffeine, another 32 ounces. And if you're sweating a lot, you know, a lot more water. So that would be the other one. Um, and then, you know, unfortunately, the way that um, we eat foods and that they're highly cooked and uh, treated. And like you said, they're not, even if you think you're getting good food quality from the earth, um, it's maybe adulterated in some way and not to make you neurotic, but it's got pesticides and sprays and chemicals and GMOs and bacteria and mold and whatever. So the bottom line is, is that in order to safeguard yourself, I'm a big believer that we lose our digestive secretions earlier and earlier and earlier. I mean, you're seeing hypochloridria, you know, someone who's not able to secrete stomach acid at, you know, as a, as a young adult or a teenager. I mean, and that's never, so, you know, aside from the basic boring stuff that you call it, you know, it's like, oh, the boring stuff, like, you know, the actual getting healthy and eating real foods and drinking, you know, good quality water, good, good, good quality air. And I would also add probably digestive secretions as well, supporting that in some way. As and well. I, I would, yeah, and I would say to some degree, uh, those things are important. Definitely the water is important. Getting minerals in your water. I would tell you that the vast majority of people I look at are magnesium deficient because stress depletes magnesium. So if there was a miracle supplement that I would add to that list of maybe the black cumin seed, maybe the sulforaphane uh, is a good form of a chelated magnesium. And then it, get, it does get down to, if you know that, you know, I, I think we start, I think everybody can start with a whole food diet, right? Uh, now there's nuances to that, but so they don't get themselves stressed out, right? Or get neurotic, right? There's stuff in everything. Definitely focus on whole foods first. Uh, and then, then you can start kind of weaning those things out. So I agree with you there. And I, I definitely see that people are, are having digestive issues uh, and problems with stomach acid production, problems with bile physiology, problems with pancreatic enzyme release, uh, gutty issues, they become issues. And we know that thyroid hormone, if, I, if I'm having thyroid hormone deactivation, if I have that cellular hypothyroidism, I'm, going to, uh, I'm not going to be able to make stomach acid sufficiently. So low stomach acid is an indication potentially that we have cellular hypothyroidism going on. Uh, so yeah, we can provide them with support and I think you and I would agree it's sometimes easier or better to start at the top end and support stomach acid production because that could potentially support bile physiology and it could potentially support pancreatic physiology. Um, but maybe sometimes you have to add that bile support and pancreatic enzyme support. But really, when I look at somebody and I see their blood work in that, or I see that they're, they're, they have hypochlorhydria, and they, they have other hypothyroid symptoms. I, I know that's a key factor for me that there's some type of chronic stress here. If I'm, if I'm in chronic stress, do I need digestion or do I need to run from the tiger? Right. And so, yep, yeah, that's one of those things where we talked about before they may need individually, they may need um, some level of support to help the systems get back on track. Right. And so uh, I can provide it with some stomach acid support and that may be key because of they have chronic GI issues and their chronic GI issues is not that they don't take enough antibiotics or probiotics. The issue is they've lost the innate antimicrobial system of the GI tract. And why is that again, stress? I don't need digestion. I need to run. I don't need sex. I don't need, you know, all these other things. Um, I need to address the, the stressor, but I may need to support them in the short run. Right. And so I, I I'm a, I'm a fan of lots of, uh, different things to help our patients get back to health. Um, and, but I think as a primary thing, then one of the best things we can do uh, is to help our patients, even though it's not sexy, get, get back to original focus and say, okay, what are, the, are you doing the foundational things right? No. Okay. Let's get started there. Cause those are the things that you need to learn how to do long-term. And then we can, if those, if you're struggling to you do those foundational things, then we can use the diet uh, or supplementation and testing and a bunch of those stuffs and figure out why you're struggling with those things. I mean, blood sugar is a great re, you know, a great um, example of that. If we have chronic stress and we have cellular hypothyroidism, you're going to have insulin resistance. You're going to have blood sugar dysregulation because you need thyroid hormone to transport glucose efficiently into the cells. So if I can't transport glucose efficiently into the cells, I become essentially um, 
uh, I start to have blood sugar dysregulation. My blood sugar rises. My pancreas then has to make more insulin to try and jam it into the cells. And then we start this process of insulin resistance and into diabetes. And that person's like, I'm always hungry. I'm always craving food, right? Because they're, they're, they can't get the sugar into the cell because of the chronic cell danger response. Yeah, we can take a drug and force that sugar into the fat. Now the labs look good, but are we really fixing the problem? And the easy thing to do is tell that person, all right, we got to have to transition you from a carbohydrate based diet, which is your brain is craving because it's having a hard time making energy to a fat based diet. It's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be easy. And, but we may have to, but we need to transition them that for the long run and the benefit of getting them there, it's going to help them in the long run, reduce that, some of the health problems we see. I know I got off track and I'm, I'm not sure what I- Oh, was. awesome. <laughs> I appreciate it. I really, first of all, I want to thank you for your time. I mean, it's, you know, I, I consider you a mentor. I, I really love the information that you provide. And, um, you know, we're giving our time here because we want to make a difference, right? We want to see people get healthy and, you know, it, it gives us, I'm sure with you, it gives us deep internal or intrinsic, you know, rewards to see someone who's not doing well and turn their life around and then go on to help other people. You know that you've just now not only helped that person, but you've helped whoever that person comes in contact with as well. So thanks, number one, for, for being on the call and sharing your wealth of information. Um, I'm excited to finally get your book out. Um, tell us a little bit about that on, in parting in terms of, I know you've got a book coming out and then how do we get in contact with you if I really liked what I heard and I want to you know, hear more from you and where do I talk to you or get in contact with you? Yeah, so um, the book hopefully will be out next year. I partnered with a friend of mine, Dr. Kelly Halderman, um, to help me get that project done because it's been a thing I've been talking about for a while. So hopefully we'll have that finished uh, sometime next year. Um, uh, if somebody wants to get a hold of me, you know, uh, our our office name has changed a couple times in the last couple of years just to get a better reflection of what we who we are and what we do. Um, so our new, our new company and our new website is Rejuvagen Center. Uh, Rejuvagen is a functional and regenerative medicine clinic. Our office is in Glen Mills, Pennsylvania, but we do telemedicine. So we, I, take, I take care of people from around the country and around the world, uh, helping them with chronic health conditions. Um, if they want to reach us, they can reach us at rejuvagencenter.com. Um, I'm always, I have a website, thyroidproblemsdoctor.com. We have a uh, podcast, Thyroid Answers podcast. Uh, I do with Dr. Erica Riggleman. And then I have uh, thyroid videos on Vimeo and YouTube under Thy Thyroid Thursday. And as I, I think we said offline is I'll probably just be putting those Thyroid Thursdays right into the podcast, just make it easier uh, to get all the information out so it's in one place. Um, but yeah, always available. Um, via Facebook, you know, it's Rejuvagen uh, or Rejuvagen Center on Facebook. Uh, you can find us there, but that's where we're at these days. Yeah, you picked a really easy word to spell, Rejuvagen. How do, how do you spell that? <laughs> R-E-J-U-V-A-N. Rejuvagen. I think I spelled it wrong. R-E-J-U-V-A-G-E-N. Rejuvagen. So uh, yeah, we, uh, we had to make up a name essentially to kind of uh, get our point across. So that's what the, the brighter minds came up with. But we okay, like it. All right. well, it's good. It's, it's basically you're into reju you reju regenerative rejuvenating medicine, correct? Easy for me to say. Rejuvenate yeah. and regenerate. Yep. So put those two words right. together and that's essentially what you get. Awesome. Well, Eric, thank you so much for being here. I, I appreciate the, the time, the wealth of information, and I wish nothing but uh, good health and happiness for your family and success. And I want to see that book come out and make sure that I get my own signed edition. And, uh, and I wish you all the best. All right. Thanks, Joel. It's great Thanks, being here. Take care. Yep, thank